My name is Jameson Chiso. I'm a Peter Israel uh, in the West of Cape Town, Kutuske in Kutuske Hospital. I'll be talking today about uh, urolithiasis and the role of uh, intestinal microbiome. Um, so, with my touch, I'll be start talking about uh, just urolithiasis in in general. Um, the incidence of uh, urolithiasis here, yeah, it varies according to geographical ethnical, genetic, and also dietary differences. And the prevalence like in the, it's around one to 20% in the general population. And in the US it's about 8.8%. Um, most of the incidence now is now like in the US now due to in, uh, metabolic disease, things like diabetes, hypertension, and also due to increasing use of imaging. So now there's a, now a high pickup rate here. Yeah. So then the incidence goes up. Then the recurrence rate in stone formers is usually 10 to 30%. And in first time stone formers, it's about 26% recurrence rate in, in five years. Um, and there's a male greater than females affected and also whites greater than blacks. And it's for the whites, it's just the, the non-Hispanic whites more than the Hispanic whites than the blacks, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that one, that was just in the graph uh, that I just got with uh, short age-specific uh, kidney stone incident rates. Uh, this is uh, taken from data in the in the US, where there were like three cohort uh, studies, which involved I think about eight thousand two hundred cases that were confirmed among about two hundred and fifty thousand participants. Uh, when singular the incidences uh, goes. Uh, in those ones, usually around 2.5, and uh, most of it is uh, mostly in that age group of uh, um, 35 to 50 age group. Oh, why did I do? Hey, what? Where am I sliding? Did I take everything? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what's happening to the slides here. Yeah. Oh, sorry for that. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, the slides are there. Oh, no, there's another one after that. Yeah. Sorry, wait. So when you look at the etiology of this uh, stones, yeah, you have non-infectious stones, uh, which are usually calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate and the uric acid. And with the infection stones, you've got the um, magnesium ammonium phosphate stones and those that highly carbonated appetite and also the ammonium urate stones. And then you have those that result from just genetic causes like the um cysteine stones, uh, xanthine, and also the 2.8 dioxidin stones. And then you get the drug stones like the one that come with the use of uh, uh, indinavi and also other various drugs like loop diuretics. Um, stone composition, usually um, most of the stones are calcium oxalate stones, um, usually 70 to 80%. And with the calcium phosphate accounting for about 15%. Appetite more than the brushite ones. And the uric acid accounting for about 8% of the stones and cysteine, um, one to two percent. It's true vice, which are these infection stones, about one percent, and then the miscellaneous. So of the risk factors for stone, uh, you've got the modifiable and the non-modifiable risk factors. So the modifiable risk factors you have um, so the high urine calcium, which is high call uric acidia, um, in, it happens in up to 50% of those idiopathic stone formers. Um, there's actually no consensus on the cutoff points of urine and calcium excretion. Uh, some most um, others would go for 200 to 50 to 250 milligrams per day. Um, though some will go for four milligrams per kg per day. Although they say that the risk of actually stone formation increases actually with calcium uh, levels in the urine of greater than 100 milligrams per day, not really the high 200 to 250. And when you look at this one per kg, the four milligrams per kg, most don't use because if you realize 
urine output is usually recommended to be somewhere around two and a half liters uh, output um, a day. But uh, if you use this four milligrams per kg per day, then someone who is a base or a certain, um, who weighs more, uh, you would you expect them to excrete more of calcium in the urine and say it's normal, so which is not the case, yeah. So actually should be just try to limit urine and calcium to just uh, below like 100 milligrams per day um, mm -hmm. because it's been associated once it goes above 100 with the increased uh, uh, stone formation, yeah. And usually the hyperuricalcemia is... Um, Contributable to either increased intestinal absorption or resorption in the kidneys, or probably defect in tubular calcium uh, reabsorption. Then we have got the high urine oxalate. Um, you, know, you know, oxalate is actually implicated in stone formation by it being combined with calcium from calcium oxalate stones, and uh, also to form on the needles of maybe calcium phosphate, and you get mm -hmm. calcium oxalate forming in there. So the widely used um, Cut of urine oxalate is about less than 45 milligrams per day. Although they say the risk increases with the oxalate, urine oxalate of greater than 25 milligrams per day. And uh, also we could seen with the reduced calcium intake. And um, with calcium intake um, in the gut, calcium actually combines with the um, oxalate in the intestine to form um, calcium oxalate, which is um, uh, not reabsorbed and just excreted, and then you prevent um, high oxalate being absorbed and also having high oxalate in the urine. So, and to, you know, you can get endogenous oxalate from glycine metabolism and also ascorbic acid, which is uh, vitamin C. Um, the reason why you really get this high oxalate, with, especially with vitamin C, the implication is when you take oxalate with concurrent calcium diet, so, so they encourage you to, you can take, you can have a glass of milk with your, with, your, with your meal, especially in the evening. But most people, when they take the supplements of vitamin C, they take without meals. So you're basically like taking vitamin C alone, which is later converted to oxalate. And at that time, because you are not taking with a meal with some calcium that may bind with it and prevent it from being absorbed, you end up having a, a I also like. Then also the issue of altered gut microbiome, it actually results uh, in the loss of this oxalobacter formigens, which is a bacteria mainly implicated in the uh, microbiology of our uh, oxalate stone formation in the gut. Uh, you know, this um, oxalobacter formigens, it actually breaks down oxalate and promotes enteric secretion and reduction in the, um, the hence reduction in urine oxalate. Uh, like I said, vitamin C supplements results in high oxalate and primary hypoxaluric enzyme defects, deficiency also leads to high oxalate and uh, glycolate. Also, the low citrate is one of the also modifiable risk factors for stone forming. Because if I uh, low urine citrate, citrate is actually a stone inhibitor. And so, hypocitrate levels like below 320 milligrams have been seen to. Uh, are actually predisposed to stone formation. And also in tubular lumen, um, citrate also combines with calcium to form a non-dissociable soluble complex. So actually citrate actually inhibits calcium oxalate crystal agglomeration. And also cases of chronic metabolic acidosis like um, in um, proximal to in uh, renal tubular acidosis, you actually get uh, proximal tubular reabsorption of the um, citrate and also reduced excretion. And this is also the mechanism where you get uh, stone formation in high animal protein intake, because high animal protein intake, when it's amino acids are broken down, you get a um, high acid load in the proximal tubules. And this will now promote um, calcium uh, combining with oxalate into a more um, uh, non dissociable and a soluble complex, which is easily absorbed in the uh, proximal tubules. So, when the urine gets to the discharge tubules, you have less citrate there and you've got high uh, chances of forming stones. Then you, you get to that. So, high uric acid in the urine is implicated in stones in males, it's about 800, um, more than 800 milligrams, and in females, it's about, uh, 750 milligrams per 24 hour. 
Um, so uric acid crystals, they actually act as a nidus for calcium oxalate precipitation. And the low, actually low pH is the major determinant for uric acid stone. You may have the diuric acid in the urine, but you, in the absence of a low pH, uh, usually you may not really form much of stones, but when the pH um, say goes below 5.5, uh, it favors uric acid stones and pH is above like 6.5 will favor calcium uh, phosphate stones. Um, also, low urine volume is implicated. You know, your, the low urine vol the volume will lead to high concentrations of these lithogenic um, materials in urine. And so it's encouraged to have a urine output so about 2.5 liters per day and also to increase the fluid uh, intake. Then, data modifications. Um, done to increase fluids, to increase fluids, increase fruits, also veggies, uh, calcium, and also increase dietary protein. Um, as I, uh, okay, as I urine citrate and uh, also low oxalate. Then reduce also sweetened beverages. They have been implicated in uh, stone formants, also preserved foods and also non-dietary protein. Uh, non dairy protein is an animal protein that you are getting, and also high sodium uh, is also in play category. Get sodium and calcium go end in the end in the um, excretion in the renal tubules. Then you also get some medications in pro in, involved, like loop diuretics, laxatives, also like carbonic and hydrates inhibitors like acetazolamide, antivirals like the Indinavi and uh, Sanavi, and also sulfur containing medications like cotrimotas or and sulfur. And you get the non modifiable ones, you get like genetic, like the cystinuria, which you know it's uh, usually the dibasic amino acids, uh, the cola ones that are involved, the cystine, onithin, uh, lysine, and arginine. Then you also get those with uh, family histories, and also get those with medical conditions like hyper, primary hyperparathyroidism. Hypertension is also implicated, gout, diabetes, people with medullary sponge kidney, also probing um, calcium phosphate stones, so distal type uh, one, renal tubular acidosis, inflammatory bowel disease, short bowel syndrome, um, gastric bypass surgery, and also chronic upper, uh, upper tract UTI. Then you also get others like um, warm climate and occupation like steel workers and physicians. Uh, <laughs> This one actually made the life when I saw it in Absidia that uh, physicians are uh, also put in the high risk group because people work in operating theaters, they check less fluids, which I think they have long ops and um, few breaks, and you end up probably dehydrated by the end of the day. So, most of the wake up, um, those when you are wake up, is always, uh, I just put on, on the guidelines, the guidelines, they will usually use the European guidelines, and that's part of the recommended wake up for this. But as part of wake up, you will need to do your biochemistry, uh, which is usually your blood, the uh, urine, to just see your CMP, your calcium. Uh, if your calcium is high, then you are prompted to work and probably do parathyroid and stuff. Then also, if you're part of the wake up urine, you're going to involve those during 24 hour collections and also on the spot urine analysis, like in kids' work, are not yet potty trained where you can't really do 24 hour urine. And when you do imaging, in the past, you can do X-rays, then you have to see these radio effect stones, but you may not be able to see those with the low on-street units, like the cystine, uric acid stones, and those in genetic or infection stones. So um, IVP, this is intravenous pyelogram, quite of an old thing, but in limited resource setting, people use intravenous pyelograms. Then um, uh, usually an ultrasound scan, usually you may pick it, we know that uh, caustic shadowing, but it's not the number one choice, but the number one modality for picking stones with uh, a, uh, a smaller rate of missing stones is a non-contrast CT scan. Um, so the uh, European guidelines actually strongly recommend that you perform stone analysis, say in first time stone formers, um, you just use it in the validated um, procedures. So every stone for my first time stone, you want to check the stone for analysis so that you see the composition that will tailor also your wake up and also your management. Yeah, And also to repeat, it strongly also recommends repeating stone analysis in patients who present with recurrent stones despite drug therapy 
and also those with early recurrence after complete stone clearance and those who have late recurrence after a long stone period was they may have a different stone forming so this is just a table just showing inhibitors and promoters of stone blood um of the kidney stone formation um i'll just quickly also jump this one then we see, um, just some um, illustration of just the steps in stone formation where you have your urine um, uh, super saturation and um, you get your nucleation aggregation that you get this growth which is uh, propagated then you get crystal and cell interaction and fixation usually in the kidneys after some renal tubular cell injury then you got secondary crystal growth and also crystal aggregation and stone formation so the intestinal microbiome um just the role of the intestinal microbiome so in recent years there's been um uh, major debate now and um, studies now working into genome sequencing and all that looking into the gut bacteria and its contribution to urolithiasis and mostly it's in the case of uh oxalate stone so so the so in this recent sense, there's the role of intestinal microbiome in influencing the composition of the urine, and it also has been explored, resulting in data suggesting that it affects kidney stone incidence. So the discovery of oxalate degrading bacteria, this oxalobacter formigens, faced by Allison and co-workers in 1985, it has actually attracted uh, some considerable attention regarding its involvement in ox uh, oxalate stone disease. So oxalate is used actually as a um, is a carbon energy source um, for in carbon energy source for this bacteria. Well, they use that and usually they are strictly anaerobic bacteria, um, strictly in the gut, thriving in there, and they use the carbon part in the oxalate to so in the next net result is a less absorption of uh, oxalate and also reduce the urine oxalate. So that's the mechanism of stone prevention that the microbiome is involved in stone formation. Both absorptive and also secretory pathways have been identified in the proximal and the distal segment of the colon. This is a part of an illustration of a diagram of um, this is gut bacteria, um, um, like oxalate gut uh, degrading bacteria in the gut. Now, then you get this called enzymes actually working in, in, the, that's in the intestinal tract. So the net result that you get is um, your excretory oxalate uh, actually goes low and it actually ends up impacting your affecting your urinary oxalate uh, which is reduced. But this is actually the pathway that uh, gut bacteria actually convert uh, oxalate in the gut. Then I just also included um, also the kidney because you also have microbiomes also working in the kidney, but this is just a part of the ureus producing bacteria, mostly the ureus producing like the proteus, uh, Klebs here. They split actually the urea and actually promote formation of uh, ammonium and carbon dioxide. This will lead to just tubular injury and also urine alkalinization and also subsequent precipitation of this phosphate phosphate salts yeah so this is also also part of the recent advances and mechanism of uh, stone formation um so i looked also at uh, various papers the uh, looking into gut microbiome and the pathogenesis of this so this paper was published last year in 2022 by Anang king these are guys from korea uh, it was a prospective cohort study with n about 1,400, ages were about 26 to 78. They were attending a screening center. Um, speaker samples were taken at baseline. Uh, the medium follow-up was about four years. Um, they got the, also the um, exclusion criteria when they used this. So they did this 16S um, RNA gene sequencing on the speaker on the, on the, on the, on the pieces that were collected. So the, some of the exclusion criteria were like antibiotics or a probiotic being taken, taking antacid medication, also diabetes medication and history of cancer, liver cirrhosis or gout, and also CKD. Um, so usually the sample size now reduced to uh, 
911. So their conclusion was that not only the no formigens was associated with the oxalate stones, but also there are also other gut bacteria like this uh, bifidobacterium and also lactobacillus species, also altered gut microbiota uh, compared to, to healthy individuals. Uh, So that if you go and look, um, the, there's also been uh, also controversies and the you, you can you use probiotics in the prevention of these calcium oxalate stones. Now having known that these gut bacteria they uh, is in, in involved in in oxalate metabolism, um, but there's been so supplementation with a mixture actually of microorganisms. Which is knowing the pro in the gut microbiome, you've got bacteria, you've got viruses, you've got fungi also in there. And so the supplementation with the mixture of this microorganism can actually effectively restore the microbiological balance and also provide an effective uh, prevention against urolithiasis. But unfortunately, you don't uh, the knowledge of the researchers, the no researchers actually interpreted disturbances of uh, intestinal microflora as a whole. But moreover, it should be emphasized that most human, of these human studies uh, have numerous limitations. And the vast majority of such studies are actually based on small research groups and also in, in just a dozen people or so. And, and also the diet is usually uncontrolled. You don't really know it's stipulated which amounts what people are taking. And some, some of also the studies were done in animal studies uh, like mice, where people would um, just uh, colonize the mice bacteria with the uh, human feces, so they would actually implant human feces there, then actually follow them up over time. But there's been a consensus that uh, with this um, oxalate breaking or degrading bacteria, it's actually actually a reduction in stone formation when they actually dissected on postmortem the mice uh, kidneys and the tubules where they saw the crystals forming, forming in the tubules actually saw that uh, in those that had these uh, uh, oxalate degrading um, bacteria, they were actually the, the rate of stone forming was less compared to those that didn't have the uh, uh, what happened this sort of my slides i think they got mixed up when i sent on this one but so actually in a conclusion is that there's still ongoing research as to the involvement of gut microbiome in the pathogenesis of urolithiasis, but there's general consensus that uh, these um, oxalate uh, degrading bacteria actually play a role in controlling um, urolithiasis. And the routine use of uh, probiotics, um, you, people are now doing studies now which are not yet concluded where they actually the gene sequencing and stuff, then they use uh, just strains with the specific uh, bacterial strains, uh, like these all perfusions that are uh, the formigens that is used. But that is they've seen that if you use just the all formigens alone, you actually disturb the other um, micro, microbiome, I mean the microbiomes, and probably lead to either suppression or overgrowth of that and limit the, the balance. So eventually what you get is that uh, you need to, when you do probiotic uh, supplementation, you should actually do with multiple probiotics uh, to just to try and maintain that and not disturb the flora. And also with the routine use of antibiotics, especially on the chronic use of antibiotics, like those on antibiotic prophylaxis, this is actually recommended using uh, also probiotic um, prophylaxis just to try and prevent stone formation from oxalate stones. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Jamison, for a very interesting uh, topic. Um, I just want to see before I make comments if there's any questions there. Um, there's a comment from uh, Mark. So there's a question here. Artificial sweeteners have been implicated in destroying gut microbiome. Is there any way to suggest that they can promote transformation? Artificial sweeteners, it seems like they do the step, they destroy a gut microbiome. Is there anything that you've seen that would suggest 
that um, there's association with stones. Because I think I take those a lot these days. So. Yeah, this. Okay, yeah. Speaking of, okay, not just being associated with uh, just the gut microbiome, but they're actually being generally implicated in general stone forming. Um, general, so as a general measure in stone formers, we want to uh, avoid those artificial sweeteners. But in the specific to gut microbiome, I think I read somewhere where it's actually altered, um, I think there's alteration in the pH. So, so somehow there, I think it's pH related in all directions that uh, end up disturbing this uh, microbiology. But I think, yes, yeah, sweeteners are implicated in stone. Uh, thanks, Jamison. Uh, see, Prof uh, has a comment or a question. Uh, uh, thank you, Jamison, for a well put together talk and introducing uh, this concept. I, I think there have been a few uh, products on the market uh, specifically attempting to uh, repopulate the gut with uh, appropriate bacteria. And I think they've showed modest success in small trials, but I'm sure that if that was to be a solution uh, that would win someone the Nobel Prize, but I don't think we're quite there yet. I just want to highlight a paper that comes from uh, University of Cape Town. It's a little bit old now, it's about 10 years old. Uh, Alan Rogers was one of the authors who's one of the doyens of um, basic science uh, stone research. And uh, they looked at ethnicity related to gut bacteria and demonstrated uh, in this cohort that there was a difference in ethnicity in terms of both the quantity of oxalate degrading bacteria and the variety. You pointed out it's not only oxalobacter forming genes, but the other bacteria as well. And I think that work coincides with stuff in other parts of the world where they have shown an urban uh, rural divide in terms of uh, the variety and quantity of these uh, bacteria. So uh, clearly that might point to some of the explanations relate to ethnicity in the country, although uh, certain colleagues have uh, questioned the uh, validity of, of that work. But I, I think that the paper stands, it is there, uh, it's worthwhile looking at. Thank you, Jamison. Yeah, thanks, Prof, for that comment. Um, so. It, I just said just a few comments on the topic. Uh, I think Jamison is quite right. There's a lot of studies that are, are looking at uh, gut microbiome and urolithesis. And I think they've also picked up some bugs, not just uh, oxalobacter, uh, bacteria formigenes that are implicated. The, it looks like the bacteroides as well have, have been found to, to, to increase the risk of stones. And uh, Provitel has been found to be um to be protective of, of stones in patients he also mentioned uh probiotics uh in fact luckily he had an article showing that uh that they do improve the risk of getting stones uh, i saw an article that said a slightly different thing i'm not sure if the context is the same that um it doesn't not really seem to sort of reduce your risk in control patients, but in patients who are taking long-term antibiotics, then it does uh, sort of reduce the risk of getting uh, stones, but not in patients that are not taking antibiotics control. And uh, there's also been work looking at a gut uh, microbiome in patients who are stone formers. Uh, it does seem that it is altered in patients who are diabetic. Uh, patients also who are obese, they seem to have an altered uh, gut microbiome uh, despite uh, having the diabetes and obesity as a risk factor for stones. Um, yeah, so it's a very, very interesting topic. I mean, it's surely it's not something that we look at. Obviously, they've also done, the other thing that has been discovered as well, that not all oxalobacter uh, formigenous uh, uh, bacteria have the degrade, produce or secrete the degrading enzyme. Uh, some actually don't, because uh, um, I think there's been patients that uh, were proven to have the bacteria, but they it, they realized that the the outcomes in terms of getting stones were were, were not similar. And uh, when they did further test, they realized that not all uh, oxalobacter homogenous bacteria produce an enzyme that degrades. And I think Jameson touched on the on the other factors that um, oxalobacter homogenous also does play a role in uh, in um, in altering the n uh, sort of exchange uh, in the in the gut, which does 
increase the secretion of oxalate into the gut uh, and obviously reducing the risk of stone. So it also does play a role in, in degrading and also does play a role in actually increasing the secretion into the gut uh, of, ox of oxalate and that's reducing the risk. So it's a very interesting topic. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much experience. None of us has much experience in this. Um, see, there's a question there from Dr. Pinter. So I think Jamison can just comment on that. The role of stool transplant uh, is coming up in a big way in other conditions like endocrine. Absolutely, uh, Dr. Pinter. And I think there's also studies showing that, I mean, in patients at risk and have problems with oxalobacter, if you do do a, a um, Still transplant their the uh, um their risk of stones reduced and you're quite right it's also been seen in other conditions you mentioned endocrine there's also um in patients with ibd i saw that as well uh i think uh, uh i think there's i mean obviously not in asthma but apparently in asthma your gut mortality is uh, gut microbiome is affected but uh, but you're quite right there are other uh areas where um you and in bariatric surgery, I don't know if Jameson in a comment. Also, yeah, in those that showed bowel syndrome in bariatric surgery or those who have had bypass surgery, um, those what the happens, you, you get um, uh, disturbance in the gut flora, and also, you know, you get um, these, um, these, these bio salts uh, being released from the, the, the bio salts in the bio. So even they just transit, especially in that short now. And then when they are um, in the large intestine, you now actually uh, get, um, you actually promote oxalate, um, actually reabsorption, they actually form salts. And the oxalate, they are more soluble than the bio salts. So those are preferential, they really absorb there and you get uh, high oxalate in there. So also doing gut, I mean, to pick out transplant, in those patients that is short well because of their also gut uh, uh, microbiome actually improves and reduces the rate of stone formation yeah thank you thanks a lot um i, I don't know if there's anyone has got a question it doesn't look like we have anything on the charts uh thank you thanks to the pinter once again thanks to everyone who joined our exciting uh, session this morning uh we'll see you guys in the next week